Day 691 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here. And today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently... Russia sits on 370,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 980 in the past 24 hours. Then as for hardware losses, 14 tanks, 20 APVs and 24 artillery. Then we'll head back to the map today and start out in Volgograd, the Russian oblast, as civilians continue to find... Russian KH-101 cruise missiles that crashed inside this uh, Russian territory. And in this instance, this one was found in Yellen. Which means that these cruise missiles were likely fired from Russian aircraft coming from Saratov. Possibly the Engels airbase. Now, we've heard that Ukraine has these new electronic warfare capabilities to, in fact, take down missiles, like these cruise missiles, but I, I doubt that was the case for these ones, as it was more likely a case of horrible failure rates for, for Russian forces. Then we'll move across to the Russian border oblasts of Kursk and Belgorod, as explosions were reported in both of these regions overnight. For instance, local residents said that they heard three to four explosions over the city of Kursk and then saw a bright flash. And the likely cause was due to Ukrainian drones infiltrating into Russian airspace in a likely bid to take out Russian launching sites, airfields or air defenses. And then in something of a related story... Russians in the Belgorod Oblast are calling for a 15 kilometer or about 9 or 10 mile buffer zone with the Ukrainian border. However, Russia doesn't seem capable of creating a buffer zone of 100 meters, let alone 15 kilometers. And many analysts uh, suggest or assert that a military option to achieve this suggested buffer feat is almost impossible given Russia's tied up military resources all along the 600 mile or 1000 kilometer front line with Ukraine. Although it should be mentioned, if Russia wasn't firing missiles from its own lands into Ukraine, then it obviously wouldn't need this military buffer in the first place, would it? Then we head over to the Ukrainian map today and start out in the once occupied uh, Vovchansk settlement in the Kharkiv Oblast as Russian aviation destroyed a warehouse with grain uh, via the use of two airdropped gliding munitions. And do note, Russia has repeatedly targeted Ukrainian businesses, particularly those in the agricultural sector, as a part of its own economic war on Ukraine. Then we'll head across into the northern Donbass as Russian forces advanced near Mikivka which is a name of a small settlement, different to in the south. Uh, this one looks to be about here. Okay, there we go. And you can see the little salient point there, which is for a really a, a larger location, which has had its back and forth land grabs over time between both opposing forces. But problematically for the invading forces stationed here, any forward movements would soon come up against a river and high ground, which of course is Ukrainian controlled. In fact, when you go down on the map, things don't look much better at all, at least in terms of a, an invading force. Then also, believed to be in the north, another spectacular explosion for the strike album, as Ukrainian drone operators from the Flying Skull team skillfully hit the ammo rack of this Russian MBT, totally obliterating the vehicle. And in a similar spirit, when we move down across to Abdivka, no changes on the map per se in the last day or even two, but we do have an assortment of recent scrap metal photo snaps after Russian offensive attempts in the area failed. Then somewhere in the east, uh, what we see here is a picture of an AFU drone with an RPG-7 warhead strapped to its underbelly. Now, obviously, there's about a, a dozen Russian soldiers here, which look to be transported from the rears, getting shipped off to the front lines. 
And to have a Ukrainian FPV drone just come up into their positions all of a sudden without these guys even getting to their actual starting positions must be pretty demoralizing. And perhaps what's even more amazing is that none of them really seem to show any situational awareness to look out for or even shoot at these AFU birds in the sky. But it's also quite likely that any rifles that these soldiers do have or did have before the events that uh, unfolded moments thereafter were likely provided without ammunition. As many Russian soldiers shipped off to the, the front lines don't seem to get that privilege of ammunition, which is something that the Russian Ministry of Defense seems to have been enforcing so that no training camp mutiny can occur, for instance. Then somewhere else in the east, we saw the first destruction of the newest Russian electronic warfare system, the Bailina, and destroyed as a result of perhaps what seemed to look like a HIMARS strike. Now, Russia planned to adopt these systems in a couple of years' time, but due to the ongoing three-day special military operation for Russia, they decided to push it to the front lines a little bit early. And what's most fascinating is that this expensive, expensive piece of equipment wasn't even doing the one job it was designed for. Obviously, due to a non-friendly Ukrainian recon drone in the sky taking footage of the electronic warfare system unimpeded. Then, just moving across the map briefly, as there was a, a Russian missile downed uh, near or over the city of Krivi Ri, which is a little bit north of... Kherson right there in the south. And an event like this does tend to remind me of the end of 2023 and the start of this month in 2024, where Russia performed several large wave missile salvos into Ukraine in a very short space of time, about a week. And touch wood, those rates of fire have significantly dropped since then, which is interesting because we did notice Russia using missiles from uh, those waves that, that were produced in Q4, so the fourth quarter of 2023. So although it is a little too early to speculate about a stepping down of Russian missile strikes into Ukraine, the signs are indeed starting to show. Then moving across for some big news today for uh, quite the significant loss for Russia. As Ukraine has reportedly downed a 330 million US dollar Russian A-50 early warning and control plane over the Azov Sea. Now, the long-range radar detection aircraft acts as a corrector uh, during massive attacks on Ukraine. Russia also uses them to detect Ukrainian air defense systems as well. Now, Russia had anywhere between 7 and 10 of these at the start of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, with maybe 3 to 6 of them in any operationally ready condition right now. And this would actually make for their second loss of this aircraft type since the invasion, as previously an aircraft of this type was damaged by a drone at the Belarus Machulischi Air Base uh, about this time last year. Also, and just as importantly, Russia is not building any more of these, so it's quite the loss for their military to suffer. Also on that topic, it appears Wikipedia was erroneously updated for a couple of minutes before it was taken down, stating that the A-50 was also used as a submarine in the Sea of Azov. Cheeky little bugger, whoever did that. But then, if that wasn't enough for aircraft losses for, for Russia, a, a Russian IL-22M command and control plane was reportedly hit in the Sea of Azov as well. This time, uh, now in initially thought to be as a result of friendly fire incidents from the Russian side, of course, but later confirmed to be shot down by the Ukrainian Air Force, as confirmed by Ukrainian Army Commander-in-Chief uh, Zulizny. Now, there was a call intercepted from the Russian IL-22M aircraft and the Anapa airport in Russia requesting an emergency landing at the nearest Russian airfield and disappeared from radars over the horizon after that. And although difficult to confirm the, the really the full outcome for this plane, uh, Russian telegram channels seem to claim that it made some sort of a landing on a Russian airstrip uh, with wounded on board. Then briefly we'll move across to the Kherson Oblast as 
Russia has failed to dislodge a few hundred Ukrainian troops that uh, created the, the bridgehead at Krinky. Even though Russia has tried to do uh, to, to really dislodge them uh, every day for the last few months. I mean, it's really been quite the, the failing campaign of the Russian army here. Which really tells us about the uh, cretinous military cluster fluck of a situation that Russia finds itself in. Uh, for instance, a uh, Ukrainian FPV drone uh, hit a, a Russian tank in Kriki most recently. But in the wider macro of events, it's been such a loss for the Russian forces, losing at least 163 pieces of light or heavy equipment, including tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, at this very little small pocket of a region alone. As a result, uh, the Russian forces have assigned a tank regiment to fetch the wrecks. Although, just like the insufficient planning that saw the, the Russians go into Krinky and never come out, pretty much every day of the week. Therefore, this Russian retrieval regiment is likely going to only have the same outcome or effect. Then we'll head down south on the map as it seems as busy as ever uh, with Ukrainian resistance groups in the occupied peninsula of Crimea. For instance, we see a Ukrainian ribbon-colored snowman in Yalta, also, we saw the Ukrainian coat of arms sprayed onto the Alupka city rocks as part of the ongoing yellow ribbon movement within the region. And perhaps the biggest news to come out of this region in the, in the past week, in fact, just the last couple of days, was that there were Ukrainian partisan female saboteurs who have reportedly poisoned many dozens of Russian soldiers. There was even a shootout reported, but the status of these saboteurs is, is not yet known. Then we'll head across to some news for the day. So at the recent Davos event of the World Economic Forum held in Switzerland, the Russo-Ukrainian war was a focal point of discussions where Ukraine reiterated its peace plan to national security advisors from over 80 countries. Now, of course, this plan includes crucial points such as the restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, the withdrawal of Russian troops, and the protection of food and energy supplies. Also, the Swiss federal councillor, Ignacio Cassis, stated that China plays a significant role in these events and that this consortium of nations needs to find a way to work with China on ending the war. And certainly, with China being Russia's largest trade partner for over a decade, making this long-standing partnership crucial for Russia, especially considering the economic sanctions imposed by Western countries. As such, it makes obvious sense to see how China's leverage could be used to benefit an outcome here. Now, normally this is easier said than done, but with China now facing its own set of vast economic challenges... This could, at a point, make China more amicable towards having a much greater cooperation with the West on Russian concerns. Then moving across to another Russian military mobilization blunder segment, and in Putin's latest plan or attempt to mobilize more individuals from within his country, Russia has been reportedly turning off the heating in Russian jail cells to entice prisoners to voluntarily sign contracts to go to the war in Ukraine. And it's not surprising really, because in terms of rough figures, Russia's prison population has gone down about 170,000 since the invasion of Ukraine. And on face value, it might seem like Russia turning its prison population into soldiers is a great idea. But this or these penal battalion or units have been known for being incredibly undertrained and ineffective, even for simply plugging the gaps in the front lines. But especially also when used within storm assault units, where arguably you need to be at your most trained, not least. And as with this news story and other, many others that uh, report on this, Russia has once again turned back to the bottom of the barrel tactics for mobilization methodologies. Although problematically for them, and as we've learned from a multitude of reports past and present, that the Russian Ministry of Defense has been finding it increasingly difficult to get the leftovers in the prison population to go to Ukraine. 
because these days there are very few willing and volunteering prisoner participants actually wanting to go, likely due to word getting out that it's no paradise to go to Ukraine, even in comparison to a Russian jail cell. Then moving across to a quick funny to round it all off today guys, so it looks like Russia wants to build a new aircraft carrier. Now, starting off for a bit of context, uh, if we are to take a look at countries with one or more notable aircraft carriers, you will notice USA with 11, uh, China with 3, uh, UK with 2, and Russia with 1. Ha <laughs> ha yes, the Admiral Kuznetsov which has been plagued with a massive series of operational challenges and maintenance corruption issues over the years, and is almost always seen on fire or being pulled by a tugboat. And so as for a new one, well, there is a series of economic, technical and industrial factors, or constraints, we should say, which suggest that Russia may not see another aircraft carrier or even one that's working for another five, ten years, decades even to come. So that will have to be it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, and subscribe if not already. Almost hitting that 100k mark really helps boost out the channel. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.